Hi, I'm Micah Halpern. Thank you for joining me today as I do some thinking out loud. Our first segment is called Background Briefing. The first thing I've been thinking about is electoral politics. Today's electoral politics has regressed from a dignified vehicle of democracy and has become a circus, and sometimes it can even be called a carnival. A circus because of the crazy things that are happening and the carnival because sometimes those crazy antics are so amusing. In democracies, elections are essential. Actually, they are definitional. That is, you can't have a democracy without an election. So election season used to be just plain boring. It's a lot of the same stumping, no controversy, no crisis, very few assassination attempts. Today, our presidential election season is anything but boring. This is not just happening in the United States. This year, more than 50 countries in Europe, India, Mexico, South Africa, are having elections. Over a billion people around the world will cast their vote this year. Almost all these elections share the same ridiculous characteristics. The major fear in all these elections is disinformation. Disinformation. In the U.S., both political parties fear disinformation and trade in it at the same time. Fear and trade. As disturbing as the disinformation situation was four years ago, it's far worse today. Far worse. The status has changed mostly because of artificial intelligence, AI, and their generated material. All produced videos, that is AI produced videos, sound bites, still pictures, and news stories. They produce Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, and X material that swirls across the metasphere. Entire stories from beginning to end are fabricated. They spin through social media and the fakes are even picked up, posted and printed and reported by traditional news outlets. Most young people today get their news from social media and almost everyone, everyone who reads news is exposed to some form of social media somehow. The political campaigns know this and the campaigns are targeting every electoral demographic across the social media platforms, all platforms targeting literally every single voter. While once upon a time news was about objectivity, today it's very much about subjectivity. Political spin masters with creative spirits and with vim and vigor weave together spectacular untruths, posts and spread them. Some people are skeptical while others are gullible, but in reality the vast majority are in the middle believing some stories while questioning others. As a whole, these truths or untruths have poisoned the masses against the media and by extension politics and elections. People have become skeptical of all politics, campaigns and politicians. Campaign strategists closely watch the uncommitted voter and the undecided person, but in many ways that uncommitted person has felt betrayed by the oodles of media and the blatant lies, the spins, and the obvious untruths. For example, the economy is better today than it was four years ago. Everyone has been exposed to farce and that they have heard the lies. Claims that the Butler, Pennsylvania attempted assassination was faked, or pictures were faked, or the Trump reaction was rehearsed, saturated social media. All this, the lies, the fakes, the assassination attempts, has led Americans to a state of election anxiety. Election anxiety. Psychologists and therapists are treating patients who exhibit forms of depression generated by elections. Therapists claim that the numbers are far greater than you would expect. The numbers for election anxiety and election depression for this election are far greater than the last, that is four years ago. They don't give details and the numbers they speak of are anecdotal. There is no reason to not believe them, to doubt them. Why would we doubt them? If you remember in 2016, after the Trump presidential win, Clinton supporters walked around like zombies in total depression. High schools in New York City created special treatment hours for classes to express and share. Mental health professionals were dispatched to high schools to help. After Trump won in 2016, people really wanted to leave the US. In Manhattan, you could not mention Trump's name on the street. It was as if he was Voldemort, the villain from Harry Potter. 
whose name could not be uttered. Uh, that was, it was fascinating. It was crazy. Elections can be fun and should be fun. Elections should force people to engage with issues at least every few years. They should not cause anxiety and depression. This farce is a worldwide epidemic. We must return to a style where truth, issues, and policies dominate the discussion. Ferris wheels, magic mirrors, sleight of hand should not dictate our elections. Coming up next, points of view. First up is an editorial from the Wall Street Journal. It was published on September 17th, 2024. It's entitled, Hezbollah gets a pager message. It's obviously a pun. The editors are making fun of the fact that the leadership of Hezbollah was the target of a spectacular attack. This is how the editors begin. The explosion of pagers held by Hezbollah operatives across Lebanon and Syria on Tuesday is an audacious display of modern technological warfare. It also is a warning to Iran's Shiite proxy militia of the human price it will pay if it continues bombing northern Israel. More than 4,000 were injured and 11 killed, according to Lebanon, when the pages exploded at all about the same time. The pages were from a shipment Hezbollah had received in recent days and passed out to its members to allow communication without the vulnerability of cell phones to eavesdropping. Bad call. Now, this is me speaking here. The numbers here that they gave are wrong. There were many more injured and many more killed. We may never know how many. They're not giving that information out. The editors continue. They relate the explanation that Hezbollah was weaving and giving about the explosions. Hezbollah officials told the press that the pager shipment may have been infected by malware to cause them to explode on receiving a signal. The malware could have caused the pager's battery to overheat, or perhaps there was a charge planted in the devices that could have been detonated remotely. Now, this is me again. Obviously, they are blaming Israel, but there is no evidence that it was Israel, and Israel has not claimed responsibility. So the editors continue. Lebanon's government and Hezbollah blamed Israel, which declined comment, but Otsar's razor says it was an Israeli operation. Israel has shown a remarkable ability to use intelligence and technology to strike behind enemy lines. In July, it killed a Hezbollah leader in Beirut, and it was almost certainly behind the assassination of Hamas leader Ismail Khania in a military guest house in Tehran. It reportedly used a remotely controlled machine gun to kill Iran's leading nuclear scientist in 2020 on a highway. Now the editors explain that those who do not understand why Israel was justified in the attack, it should be obvious, but it is not obvious to so many, so they write it out. More important than the how of the attack is the reason for the attack. Israel has ample cause to target Hezbollah fighters who have conducted a daily bombing campaign against Israel from Lebanon. They have fired more than 8,000 rockets and, and missiles at Israel since October 7th, forcing some 60,000 Israelis from their homes for nearly a year. The bombing has widened recently to other Israeli cities. No sovereign state can tolerate this, and the domestic pressure on Israel's leaders to respond has been rising. On Monday, the Israeli security cabinet added to its war aims the safe return of the northern residents to their homes. On Tuesday, Israel said that it thwarted a Hezbollah plot to kill a former senior Israeli security official. The Biden administration has warned Israel against an escalation in Lebanon, and the risks are considerable. But Israel can't afford to let the terrorist militia, backed by Iran and operating next door, bomb its territory with impunity. The pager attack was discriminating, exploding in the hands and pockets of Hezbollah combatants. The editors conclude, the message Israel can reach them, every single one of them, is essential. And now they know it. But as they ask, the message was certainly delivered. They conclude the following way. In the best case, the pager operation will persuade Hezbollah leaders that their lives are at considerable risk if a broader war breaks out. They can't say they didn't get the message. This is an excellent piece by the Wall Street Journal. Thank you very much, editors. Next up is a column also from the Wall Street Journal. It was published on September 19th, 
2024. It's entitled, Maybe It's Time for Jewish Self-Segregation. Subtitled, The Self-Protective Impulse is a Healthy Response to a Wave of Anti-Semitism. It was written by Joseph Epstein. I must admit that this is an unusual column, but his point is a good one, and the point is that because of the terrible Jew hatred Jews are confronting, it may be time for Jews to revert back to an era when Jews lived together. Not quite a medieval ghetto, but a Jewish community. This is how Epstein begins. The recent and rampant rise of anti-Semitism is, to put it gently, disheartening. One finds it everywhere. Much of it passing under the flag of anti-Zionism, criticism of Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, and presumably sympathy for the Palestinians. Saddest of all is that anti-Semitism has cropped up so exuberantly among students in our elite universities. Apart from decrying it, calling it out for what it is, what are Jews to do to protect themselves from this recurring nightmare? Perhaps a jaunt down memory lane will help. I was five when I was first aware not only that I was Jewish, but that being Jewish had consequences. My father asked me what I had learned in school one day. I told him the poem, Eeny, Meeny, Miny, Mo," which I began to recite. And when I came to the N word before tiger had been substituted as a more appropriate alternative, my father angrily stopped me and told me that I was never to use that word again, especially since our people, like the Negroes, as they were called then, had been long persecuted and called all sorts of terrible names. Over the years, I too have mentioned this awful nursery rhyme to the astonishment of people. Some simply do not believe the origin. They chuckle at me and say, oh, it's another one of your crazy historical stories, they say to me. But I'm telling you, this is 100% correct. Tiger was replacing another word. Epstein continues. A few years later, returning with my father from a Bing Crosby movie, going my way. I asked if we might have a Christmas tree. No, he said. Why not? Because we're Jewish. Case closed. Not long after that, my mother pointed out various Chicago neighborhoods and suburbs, Sanginash, Kenilworth, that were restricted, which meant no Jews allowed. Not only did being Jewish carry responsibilities, it also apparently meant being despised, at least in certain quarters. When I was 10, we moved to West Rogers Park a neighborhood in Chicago, undergoing change. We, the Jews, were the agents of change. Ours was the only Jewish family on our block. In 1947, in school, all the kids played together, but segregation by religion had set in, so I found myself invited only to parties with other Jews. I also began to attend Hebrew school, where I learned liturgy in Hebrew and prepared for my bar mitzvah, which increased my own sense of Jewishness. Nicholas Shawn, my Chicago public high school, was roughly 60% Jewish, a highly social institution. It had numerous clubs and fraternities, all of which were divided by religion. There was no cross-dating between Jews and Gentiles. The only real integration outside the classroom was in athletics. So far as I know, nobody complained about it. Jews on one side, Gentiles on the other. This, we assumed, was the way of the world. Epstein had a Jewish upbringing like many other Jews of his generation in the United States who were Jewish in feeling more than anything else, but they really felt Jewish, if for no other reason, because no one would let them in. They had to stay amongst themselves. He continues, at the University of Illinois, which I attended my freshman year, a similar self-segregation was in effect. Of the six Jewish fraternities and four sororities, none had Gentiles, nor did I ever hear any complaints about it. The only vaguely anti-Semitic line I can recall was the notion that Zayda Beta Tau, whose members tended to be, come from wealthy families, stood for zillions, billions, and trillions. In any case, I'm not sure a Jew didn't create that joke. Two different worlds. As the old song had it, we came from two different worlds. Epstein explains how Jews are not like other ethnic groups. They are more. He says that they are a nationality. I must add that they're much more than a nationality too. They're a religion, a culture, a nationality. They are a tribe, a legal system, an entire lifestyle. He continues, most ethnic groups prefer to be among their own. Certainly this was true in Chicago where neighborhoods were largely known as Irish, Italian, Greek, Scandinavian, and even for a few blocks, Assyrian. Yet Jews weren't and aren't strictly speaking an ethnic group. 
They're a nationality, a tribe, or a covenantal people. Their self-segregation was a sign that they found not merely companionship, but strength in keeping close company among their own. This is how Epstein concludes. He suggests that Jews take action on their own, live together, be together, associate together, be with one another, connect with one another. That's what he's really asking. He ends by saying, no one saw the current wave of anti-Semitism coming. Who thought Hamas would find supporters at Harvard, Columbia, and University of California, Los Angeles, and elsewhere? The country had known of this virus before, but it came not from crowds of thousands, but from prominent people like Henry Ford, it was openly anti-Semitic. No Jew in those days drove his cars. Father Charles Coughlin, on his radio show in the 1930s, attacked what he termed international bankers. But those were largely isolated. The present strain more widespread. Is self-chosen segregation among Jews a good thing? In one sense, it feels like taking a step backwards towards a less open society. Yet when politics of a country swing too far in either direction, anti-Semitism is almost certain to come in its train. The swing today is unmistakably and strongly leftist, and self-segregation strikes me as the first step in combating the attacks on Jews that attend it. I told you the column was a bit off, but it has the central point. Stay with and hang around. Hang with people who are like you, or at least who like you. Coming up, commentary through cartoons, where pictures tell the story. I want to show you seven cartoons today. Just cartoons, no memes, no headlines. Just cartoons. This first cartoon is so true. Uncle Sam is saying enough of the Nazis and Hitler. There is so much hyperbole on all sides. Just think about it. There is no way possible that either side could be Nazis or Hitlers. Just impossible. The exaggeration does, not, does a disservice to the memories of the victims of the Holocaust. It is an abuse of the Holocaust. We have to stop it. Every idea that you do not agree with or do not like is not Nazism. And every person on the other side of an issue from you was not a Hitler. It's as simple as that. Next up is a play on the old Daffy Duck cartoons where he was often getting blown up. In this case, Daffy is Hezbollah holding a pager and he says with his lisp, you're despicable. That is very, very funny. Next up is the Green Reaper of Death handing the phone or the pager or the walkie-talkie to Hezbollah. And the Grim Reaper says, it's for you. There were dozens and dozens of cartoons about the pagers and the walkie-talkies uh, against Hezbollah, the attack against Hezbollah. It was really funny and extremely difficult to choose the ones that I chose for you. In another example, the leader says, comrades, do not use electronic devices until further notice. Understood? This next cartoon is in bad taste, I admit it, but it's out there and you have to see what's out there. There have been many cartoons that push the envelope and in this case, the cartoon makes a pun on the Middle East peace and rest in peace. A missile takes off in the Middle East and kills many people. The caption reads, rest in peace. Next up is two Hezbollah terrorists walking and talking with cans and a string. The caption reads, new walkie-talkie. And finally, this last cartoon illustrates that there are bombs in cars, trees, phones, homes, everywhere, on birds, on mosques, every, everywhere where people are is where the bombs were in the pagers and walkie-talkies, and they're all blowing up. In a moment, more of my own perspective and a few predictions. In Iran, 12 people were arrested in six different Iranian provinces for being operatives collaborating with the Zionist regime, that's Israel, and planning acts against the country's security, the Revolutionary Guards said, according to the Students' News Network, which is a major media source in Iran. In Ukraine, Ukraine's air defense units destroyed 71 out of 80 attack drones that Russia launched overnight. Ukraine's air force announced that this happened. Six more of the Russian drones were lost after getting neutralized by Ukraine's electronic warfare unit. The Ukraine Air Force announced all of this on their Telegram messaging app. 
Russia also launched two guided missiles from occupied parts of Ukraine, from the area of Lonansk. The Ukrainian Air Force spoke to all of these issues. It did not say what happened to the missiles. United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guertes warned of the risk of transforming Lebanon into another Gaza. As hostilities flare between Israel and the Lebanese terror group Hezbollah, speaking to the CNN ahead of the annual gathering of world leaders, the GA, at the United Nations, Guterres cast doubt on the possibility of a ceasefire in the Gaza Strip between Israel and Hamas after 11 months of war. Hezbollah Deputy Secretary General Naim Qasem said that the group had entered a new phase of its battle with Israel, which he described as an open-ended battle of reckoning. In comments made during the funeral for a top commander killed in the Israeli strike on Beirut's southern suburbs. President Isaac Herzog revealed in an interview with Britain's Sky News that the head of Hezbollah's operations teams, Ibrahim Akil, and other senior members of the Radwan force who were killed in an attack on a meeting of Hezbollah Radwan forces commanders were gathering there to plan an October 7th style attack. Lebanon has been hijacked by a terror organization, which is also a political party in Lebanon called Hezbollah. It's been armed to its teeth by Iranian empire of evil. And all these leaders who are eradicated by the Israeli attack, all these leaders were meeting together in order to launch the same horrific, horrendous attack that we had on October 7th by Hamas. By burning Israelis, butchering them, raping their women, abducting and taking hostage old people and little babies. This is exactly the same plan that they have been planning for years under the plans of the Empire of Evil of Iran, Herzog said. Israeli Chief of Staff Herzi Halevi said that the attack on Beirut, killing Ibrahim Akil and other senior commanders of the Rabban force, prevented their plans from launch and invasion of the Galilee to murder civilians and abduct soldiers. We beat them to it, he said. And finally, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said that based on the intelligence we gathered, half of the hostages held in Gaza are alive, he told the Knesset committee. If that is true, that is remarkable. The best information I have is that less than 30 are still alive. That is a remarkably hopeful number. We've been thinking out loud about a lot today. Now that you know what I've been thinking, let me know what you're thinking. Email me at micah at jbstv.org. Tweet me at Micah Halpern. Tell me what you think. Before we end, let me leave you with one picante piece of information. We are approaching the one-year mark of that horrific day in October. The high holidays are upon us, and so is Sukkot. An awful anniversary is coming. This is a video entitled, From Chaos to Faith. A survivor from the Nova Music Festival describes what happened, how he survived, and his current calling. שאני כבר שבועיים וחצי, הצעקה הזו מהדדת לי בראש ולא יוצאת. רואי מחבלים יורים עלינו סנא! ולרגע לא הבנתי מה הוא צועק. וכשהסתכלתי עליהם, זה היה הטנדר השחור והראשון שנכנסו בהתחלה. אני פשוט ראיתי על כל טנדר חמישה-שישה מחבלים. מורידים לעברנו את הנשק ואני תוך כדי נסיעה מוריד לאשתי את הראש ולוחץ על הגז וגם עכשיו הרגל שלי רועדת ואני לוחץ על הגז עד הסוף ופשוט צועק עם ראש למטה ואני לא רואה לאן אני נוסע וצועק שמע ישראל חזק, ככה וכשאני מוריד לה את הראש, ואני מרים את הראש למעלה, אני קולט אותם, את המבטים, יורים, ואף כדור לא פוגע באוטו, ואני כבר בבריחה. פשוט עזבתי אותה, נכנסתי לשירותים, וכופפתי את הראש, ובכיתי, ואמרתי לאבא, אבא, מה אתה רוצה ממני? מה אתה רוצה ממני? <laughs> <laughs> 
אני לקחתי על עצמי, ברוך השם לקחנו אני ואשתי שבת, כבר שתי השבתות אנחנו שומרים, מחם, פלטה, סיפורים לילדות, מספרים שאני קורא בשבת ואני אומר לעצמי, לא, אני לא כזה, כן, אבל הנה אולי הגיע הזמן שאני באמת אהיה במקום הזה, כי תמיד פחדתי מהדת. היום אני לא מפחד מהדת. אחרי מה שעברתי, מה שעברנו, אני ואשתי. מה שנותר לנו זה רק להתחזק ולהאמין כשיש את הבורא לעולם, ואנחנו... איך הרב אמר לי? כל מי שניצל, הוא לא ניצל סתם. יש לכם עוד מה לעשות פה ולתקן פה. ולקחתי על עצמי שאני, בעזרת השם, אני כבר, זה כבר בדרך וזה כבר בקידום. אני מוציא ספר לזיכוי הרבים עם כל הניסים של כל החברים שניצלו. מפה אנחנו רק באמת צריכים יותר להתחזק, ויש המון 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 חברים. שלקחו על עצמם המון המון דברים בגלל התופת הזאת שעברנו ומה שהקדוש ברוך הוא מנסה להראות לנו פה בעצם בשנה האחרונה ובשנתיים האחרונות בואו נלך אחורה עוד מהקורונה אבל לא נתייחס, נלך לשנה האחרונה עם כל ההפגנות והבלגנים והמלחמת אחים ואף אחד לא מעניין אותו מהשני וכל אחד בחיים שלו אז הוא פשוט נתן לנו, איך אומרים? שיטול הקטנה, תתעוררו, אנחנו פה, אני פה, אני פה, זה מה שאני הרגשתי, זה מה שאני מרגיש. That was truly inspirational and unbelievably powerful. Thank you. Thank you for thinking out loud with me, Micah Halpern. Let's think out loud again this week on JBS. Mm-hmm.